If you're thinking to yourself, what's wrong with his voice? I should remind you that American atheists hold their annual convention on Easter weekend, so I got to spend the weekend amidst throngs of heathens and heretics having conversations in loud rooms until late into the night. Uh, by which I mean 11 p.m. or so because I'm old. And as ever, we had an amazing time. Every year we add a few more people to the crowd that spends the whole con hanging around our table. And it's gotten to the point now where American atheists just put our table next to a big seating area with couches and shit so they wouldn't keep stealing all the chairs from the other nearby tables. Though, to be fair, we still did that. So apologies once again to the Creator Accountability Network, the Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers, and the Burning Eden podcast for the perpetual chair shortage. Of course, this meant that my voice was working way harder than usual, seeing old friends, meeting new ones, having interesting conversations, and best of all, having good arguments. I mean, don't get me wrong here. I really don't like to argue. I'm defensive. I'm emotional. And I'm way better at sounding smart if I get to write out what I'm going to say in advance and then have Morgan edit it. That's why I don't do debates, no matter how goddamn many times I am challenged to them. It's just not my thing. There are other people for that. That being said, when listeners have a single opportunity to actually interact with you, very often what they want to do is argue with something you said once. And at least to a certain degree, I feel like I owe that to them. After all, in our relationship, I usually monopolize the conversation. So among the most memorable interactions I had this weekend were arguments. I argued with a listener about whether agnostic atheist is a useful distinction. I argued with several attendees at once about whether scathing atheism is ever the best approach. I argued with a transphobe that seemed genuinely reachable about trans women in sports. I argued with an ex-Amish listener who took me to task for acting like I knew way more about Amish culture than I actually do. And at the end of every one of these arguments, as I look back over it, I thought to myself, man, I'm really glad I had that conversation. Contrast that with your normal day-to-day -day experience with arguing right, where everybody is just digging their heels in, defending ever more preposterous positions in defense of an ever receding point, drawing battle lines, getting personal, hiding behind platitudes. These often useless competing tirades dominate the landscape of disagreement, whether it's online or in person. Uncle Maga and Aunt Karen fucking up Thanksgiving with ghost stories about litter boxes in schools. Your wooey coworker promoting the company's vaccine policy. That friend from 11th grade showing up on your Facebook post to assure you that Jesus does, in fact, love the little children. Arguments that you get dragged into and then dragged through. But these arguments that I had at AACON, they were the polar opposite of all that shit. Because what brought us there in the first place was an agreement to place rational thought foremost among our authorities. So unlike a religious conference, where our only common point of agreement is the world's most ambiguous book, which neither of us have actually read, or a witchy-witchy-woo con, where the fucking common agreement is to accept everybody's bullshit as equally valid, even when it's contradictory, or even a political gathering where the commonality is that all the arguments, regardless of how they're constructed, have to lead to pre-approved outcomes, right? Other, unlike all of that shit, our conference actually can have meaningful and productive disagreements. We have an agreed upon means of adjudicating them that membership in our club demands adherence to, and not from some strict enforcement from above either. It's, it's fucking definitional. You can't be a rationalist if you're not rational. And that's one of the many reasons it's so easy to laugh off the accusation that atheism is just another religion or just like religion, right? What you venerate matters. Yes, we're gathered under a mutual banner of truth, just like religious folks claim to be. But our truth has a lowercase t and it's not preordained. I mean, I, I wasn't going to change my mind on scathing atheism. I wasn't going to change my mind about trans women in sports. So it would be disingenuous to say that I was willing to change my mind in all these arguments. But I was willing to at least have an honest and open conversation that took the other person's arguments seriously and didn't dismiss them with magical phrases or appeals to authority. This is also why I find it so easy to laugh off the accusation that atheism is an echo chamber. Yes, atheists, especially the kind of atheists that would show up at a like national atheist convention, they do show a marked similarity over a broad range of political issues, right? But that's because when you first agree to let rationality determine your belief, there are a lot of political issues that necessarily lined up a single way. We live in a world where somehow is the temperature getting higher and do vaccines work are political issues, so obviously we're going to share a lot, but anybody who thinks atheists just sit around agreeing with each other has clearly never been around to atheists.
look, I get that atheist doesn't necessarily equate with rationalist, right? I'm, I'm using the terms as though they're interchangeable, but I'm aware of plenty of gatherings under the auspices of atheism that land on far less rational conclusions to basic questions, right? You don't have to be a rationalist to reject theism, but the people I'm talking to, the people who might show up at AA con and feel like they belong there for whom we don't have a linguistic shorthand, unfortunately, are worth arguing with. And when you hate arguing as much as I do, that's saying a lot.